Hello, Grantham, Grantham Village School families and friends. I just want to say welcome to our virtual STEM fair. Um, this year, our venue is a little bit different in that our kids usually present to you in person, but this year we had to make a bit of a change. So our sixth graders have put together some presentations for you. You'll see that some of them are more of what you're used to, and they have the hard copy trifold boards. Some of the boards are virtual, and no matter what, the kids were able to adapt to this change environment and they were able to um, put together a really fantastic presentation for you. Um, please enjoy our presentations and as you're watching them notice that there's an accompanying Google form where you can rate the kids STEM fair projects and they would love it if you would give them feedback and then if you have anything that you'd personally like to say to them you can feel free to email me at csylvain at gbshawks.org and I'd be happy to pass along the feedback to the kids. So please enjoy the 2020 GBS virtual STEM fair. Hi, my name is Payson, and my project was about the Uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley is a theory that a Japanese scientist suggested. It's when a robot or 3D image begins to look less like a robot and more like a human, which is fine up to a point. When the human and robot comparison hits the point of being creepy, it becomes uncanny. My hypothesis was that if I show a picture of a minion, then a picture of the conductor from the Polar Express, the people's reactions will change. I collect my data by having my test subjects look at a series of photos, then order them from what they thought was least creepy to most creepy. Then I put their answers into a spreadsheet and made the spreadsheet into a graph. My data showed a lot of variation. For the final results, I had a say in it, because to find a winner for each category, you had to base it off of how many times it was voted for, voted for in each category. Since some of them were voted for equally in each category, I got to choose which one I thought fit the criteria. If I were to do my experiment again, I would have more people participate in my experiment. With more people, I could get a more accurate answer as to which one was overall more uncanny. I hope now you know that even though our world is becoming more computerized and technology-based, you know that human faces are better than computers. Hi, my name is Mariana Utel, and I decided to find out how much weight my model trailer could hold. I conducted an experiment to find out how much weight it would take to make my chairlift break. I built a model chairlift by using a cup as the base and tape to hold the cup down to the floor. I attached a popsicle stick to the top of the cup with tape and then secured a string to the popsicle stick using a small binder clip. My prediction was that my model would be able to hold around 50 grams. So I started off with 1 gram and I barely noticed a difference in the way the lift performed. Next I moved on to 2 grams. Nothing seemed to happen again, so I bumped it up to 5 grams. At this point, I was feeling confident that my lift would be able to hold 50 grams because the only thing I noticed was that the string sagged down a little bit. Next, I placed 10 grams on the chairlift, and the string sagged down quite a bit, and the chair itself began to tilt forward. Finally, I placed 20 grams on the chairlift, and without much warning, the chair fell to the ground. My lift could only hold 20 grams, not 50. So if I had to build a new and improved model, I think I would use stronger tape and find a way to stabilize the chair better. Now I know what engineers have to go through to build real life chairlifts, and it takes a lot of trial and error. My name is Caroline Weber. My STEM project was, are fingerprints inherited? This was all about studying fingerprints from related and unrelated people to see if they were similar. My hypothesis was that the related people would have similar fingerprints to that of their parents, and that the unrelated people might have similar fingerprints, but the little details would be different. The way that I took fingerprints is having people rub their right and left index fingers in pencil lead, and then putting tape on both fingers, pulling it off, sticking it on the paper, and labeling it with their initials. I then looked at the different fingerprints and compared them to each other to see if they were similar or inherited. If I did this again, I would not take samples from unrelated people because in the end, they don't really prove anything. What I learned from my project is that fingerprints are inherited, but they are all unique. My name is Eden, and for my project, I wanted to find out which power sources work best to make a solar car go the fastest. I thought that the solar car would go fastest with batteries, and second fastest with sunlight, which is proven to be correct. To do my experiment, I 
first measured out 10 feet on a smooth and flat surface. I then ran the car back and forth with one power source 10 times and repeated that for all of the different power sources. For my data, I collected the time in seconds it took for the car to go 10 feet. I then divided the seconds it took into 10 feet to get the speed in feet per second. My results showed that my hypothesis was correct and that batteries went the fastest and sunlight the second fastest. If I redid my experiment, I would give the car a small push every time I did a trial, even if it didn't need a push to get moving, because I had to push the car a little to get the wheels spinning for one of the power sources, and to make it more fair, I should have done that for all of the sources. Hi, my name is Taylor, and for my STEM fair project, I decided to build a filter column. A filter column is a type of filter. Each element of the filter is stacked on top of each other to form a filter structure. In my hypothesis, I predicted that any of the liquids I used would come out cleaner than the original, Gatorade, root beer, and dirty water. I used three liquids, Gatorade, root beer, and dirty water. Before conducting my experiment, I constructed my filter by putting each of the following gravel, sand, activated charcoal, and filter paper into a small compartment, then stack them on top of each other. Next, I put the base on the bottom of the column and put a cup underneath to catch the liquid coming out of the filter. I then gathered my materials and prepared the different elements of the filter, gravel, sand, and activated charcoal, and a piece of filter paper. Next, I poured each liquid down the filter three times and recorded the clarity of the liquid and graphed it. I found that the filter I used did a good job of excluding syrups and colors, though there was still a tint to the Gatorade and root beer. The takeaway of this experiment is that filters can help all over the world and can be extremely helpful to countries without clean water. Hi, my name is Ollie. My topic is called Rescuing Robots. Now, what does that mean? Well, if a fire robot or a remotely controlled fire truck is remote control from a fire station, then no humans get hurt when putting out the fire. That is what my test is about. I thought that if you piloted a car from the driver's seat or looking at remote control car in my experiment, you would get there quicker and with fewer crashes than driving it remotely or looking at a video feed. So, first I set my car on the starting line, then I started my timer and drove around the course that I had set. I counted the crashes I had when driving the course. When I looked at the data from my test subjects and compared them to mine, I saw that it was faster to drive looking at the car than drive it remotely. If I were to do this experiment again, I'd get many more test subjects. What I want you to take away, does it matter that it is slower to drive a car or truck remotely when it saves lives? That is up to you to decide. My name is Abby Elk, and for my project, I wanted to find the right ratio of sugar and corn syrup. My question was, what's the right ratio of sugar and corn syrup in marshmallows? My hypothesis was if I increase the heat, the marshmallows will become more stickier than the ones with less heat. My independent variable is changing the heat, 240 on the candy thermometer because I think I will have trouble with finding the right melting point. My dependent variable is that it will become more sticky and more marshmallow-like because I want it to be as most like a real marshmallow, like at the same texture and same gooiness. What I, had, what I had to do first was create the gelatin. So I got my unflavored gelatin in cold water and mixed them together and set them aside. Next, I put the sugar and corn syrup on the stove and waited, waited until it got to 240 Fahrenheit. Next, I mixed the gelatin and sugar and corn syrup together with the mixture until it got nice and fluffy. Lastly, I put it in a tin container.
I did that three times, changing the ratio of sugar and corn syrup. For my data, I collected what each of the people I tested chose, which was what which recipe was the best tasting and which one was the best textured. For my results, four out of four thought the recipe two was the best tasting. Three out of four thought recipe two was the best textured. One of the people I tested liked the third recipe more than the second and first. If I ever did this experiment again, I would test more people on what they thought because I got more of the same opinions and I wanted different ones. What I want them to take away is that most of the people I tested liked the second recipe. It had two-thirds cup of sugar and one-fourth cup of corn syrup. Hi, my name is Peyton. My STEM fair project is about magnetic chains. The question I'm trying to answer is will the weight of the magnetic chain affect how long it takes the train to get to a certain destination? My hypothesis is that a heavier train will go slower because it presses against the surface tension more than a lighter train. To test my hypothesis, I first made a magnetic train ramp. To make the ramp, I used a wooden board and placed two strips of magnetic tape down on the board. I used two plastic guards to keep the train from falling off the track. I also put wooden blocks on the end to make sure the train didn't fall off the track. To make the train, I cut a small piece of wood into a rectangular shape, then attached small strips of magnetic tape to the bottom. I connected magnets to the front and back of the train to repel it against the stoppers at the end of the ramp. My train has two posts on the top so I can add metal washers to increase the weight of the train. Now that my project is built I tested it by doing five trials each time I added weights to the train. I timed each trial by taking a video and counting the number of pictures in each video. I learned that my hypothesis was right. I know this because the heavier train went slower. If I did this project again, I would have picked stronger magnets. That way, the effect the weights had took would be easier to see. There are magnetic trains in the world. They are cleaner ways to travel. So now if you see one, you will know a little bit more on how they work. My name is Elise Brown, and I my experiment was testing if the appearance, texture, color of food makes you think it has a flavor. How I did my experiment was I gave my volunteers three different jello flavored frostings, lime, lemon, and raspberry, then three different dyed frostings, green, yellow, and red. They told me what flavors they thought it was and how much they liked it. My hypothesis was that they would think that the dyed frostings were flavored. Instead, only one volunteer thought that the dyed frostings had flavors. If I were to do this experiment again, I would flavor the frostings with extract instead of jello powder. I think people rely on more on the flavoring than on the look of the food. My name is Garrett Brown and I made a ping pong launcher, which is a launcher that launches a ping pong at different distances. My hypothesis was that if the angle was higher, it would go further. However, I was wrong because the lower angle went further. For my procedure, I had to attach a foregrip to a table and then I had to set the angle at the one I wanted. For example, 60 degrees, 45 degrees, or 30 degrees. And attach the number of rubber bands I wanted. The data I collected was surprising since the higher the angle, the less far it went, and the lower angle went farther. My final results were perfect, even though my hypothesis was wrong. Even I were to make any changes, I would use different size rubber bands and a different ball. Hi, my name is John, and I experimented with a search and rescue robot to find where the best place to put a camera would be so that the robot doesn't crash as much. I thought that it would be the top because it will make you more self-aware. 
The way I made my project work was I set up a phone that is connected to my camera so that I could see what the camera sees. And I moved the camera around and drove the robot through the course. I went through the course three times for each camera placement. The front was actually better than the top because you didn't get as nervous that you were going to hit something. The more times I crashed, the longer it took to complete the course. I realized that when I had it on the front, I didn't crash as much and I got a faster time. If I were to change something in the experiment, if I were to do it again, it would be the robot. Sometimes it is better to not know what is around you so that you don't get distracted and nervous so that I don't crash into the obstacles. Hello, my name is Charlotte. My sim project was how smell affects taste. My question was, will the smell affect the taste of the food? My hypothesis was that with different foods with a different smell under their nose, I thought they wouldn't be able to guess the food because it's a different smell. The procedure was to get at least 10 foods in two cents, then to blindfold my volunteers, then write down the foods and the names of the volunteers, have them taste the food, and write down if they got it right or not, then graph it as percent correct at the top, and then next to it, foods. I collected if my volunteers got it right or not. My result set was that my hypothesis was wrong because I guess most of the foods were right. If I could do it again, I would make all the foods the same consistency because it would be harder for them to guess the food. I want them to take away the foods I use because if they want to do this project, they can try and consider something else. My name is Jade. My topic was making a video game for the blind. My hypothesis was that if the video game works, then the scores of the blindfolded trial and the non-blindfolded trial would be similar. The first step to my procedure was to figure out what programming language I would use. I decided to use the platform Scratch. After that, I had to code and design the game. I had to design the character and the levels. I had to code the timer, instructions, and the scoring system. After that, I had my parents play the game so that I could make a few last changes to the game. Once the game was finished, I had four different people play the game twice, once blindfolded and once while they weren't blindfolded. The data I collected was the different scores each person got in each of their trials. In my results, all the scores in the non-blindfolded trials were much higher than the scores in the blindfolded trials. If I did this again, I would like a person who is actually blind to play the game. My name is Colby, and the project I chose was trying to find the best egg substitutions in baking. This means that I had to find substitutes to put in cake batter instead of eggs and find the best one. To determine the best substitute, that substitute would have had to have made the cupcake rise the most. My hypothesis was that the applesauce would be the best substitute out of all the substitutes I chose out of banana, yogurt, and applesauce. Another part of my hypothesis was that the banana would change the taste of the cupcake because it has such a strong flavor. The first part of my project was measuring out the cupcake mix and measuring out all the ingredients including the substitutes. Then I had to bake the cupcakes once I got them in the pan. My final step was to measure how tall each substitute made the cupcakes three times to have valid information. The data I collected was that the applesauce was the worst substitute because it rose the least. The yogurt was kind of in between because it had a variety of measurements, and the banana was the best because it had the largest measurements. If I conducted the experiment again, I would measure the thickness of the batter because I feel like that would have more variation in the data. Hello, my name is Amelia Gallagher, and for my STEM fair project, I decided to ask the question, are your eyes playing tricks on you? I chose this project because my dad is an eye doctor and I have gotten optical illusions to work a couple of times. My hypothesis is I will see the after image longer if I look at the red circle for 40 seconds than if I look at it for 30 seconds. First I set a timer for exactly 30 seconds. Then I had my subject look at the red dot. When the time was up, I told them to look at the white square and I started the stopwatch. They kept telling me I still see it and when they didn't, they said I don't see it. When they said that, I stopped the stopwatch and I recorded the data. 
I did the same thing again, but I changed the time to 40 seconds. I recorded how long each person looked at the red dot, how long they saw the afterimage for, and what the color and shape of the afterimage was. The most important data was the times, and the other data was just to see if everyone got similar results, and they did. The, my hypothesis was correct. A person who looked at the red dot for 30 seconds saw the afterimage for 13 seconds on average. The person who looked at the red dot for 40 seconds saw the after image for 20 seconds on average. As you probably know, 20 is greater than 13, so therefore my hypothesis was correct. If I were to do this project again, I would use a wider range of seconds people look at the red dot for. For example, 30, 40, 50, and 60 seconds. Some people hate it when their eyes play tricks on them, but to some people it is helpful, such as surgeons. They use blue-green scrubs to minimize the afterimage of blood. Thank you for coming to see my project, and have a good day. My name is Nathan Gallagher. For my STEM experiment, I found out how to make the best cookie by comparing cookies with eggs and without, without eggs, plus flax and water. My question was, if I added more eggs to the batch with eggs, will it turn out to be fluffier? I hypothesized that the batch without egg would turn out to be dry because without eggs it would ruin the whole batch. I thought that the batch with eggs would look fluffier or look normal and that it would taste better than usual. My procedure was to follow the recipe but I made a change to the batch without eggs instead of no eggs. I put flax I put in flax and water and then had taste testers tried the cookies again. The taste testers liked the batch with eggs the best. The data was about which cookie was better. And the five taste testers liked the batch with eggs, but only one liked the batch without eggs. If I did that project again, I would take out the flax and water, let the taste and let the taste testers taste the cookies again. Hello, my name is Anna Mae. For my STEM project, I decided to study what surfaces could catch a bubble. My hypothesis was that depending on the thickness of each surface, the lighter and skinnier surfaces would be more likely to catch a bubble. For my procedure, I chose four different surfaces. Paper towels, a towel, a newspaper, and my winter coat. During the procedure, I blew one bubble onto each of the different surfaces. During my procedure, what happened was one of the bubbles blew off and landed on my damp driveway. Although I had other surfaces, my driveway was the only one to catch a bubble. It appears that this might be because a bubble is made up of a thin layer of soap that has trapped air inside. And bubbles in soap, as we know, are like two bees in a pot. So I think this is the reason why it chose to land on my damp driveway. My hypothesis was incorrect because my data showed that a bubble spent the most time on my winter coat, which was one of the heavier items. If I could go back and change my experiment, I would. I would add a wider variety of surfaces to my experiment. What I would like you to take away from my experiment is that even the most childish experiments, mine for example, can help you learn about the world around you. Science is about having fun, so just have fun with science. My name is Josh Garcia, and the topic I chose for STEM Fair was the Rubik's Cube. I was wondering what Rubik's Cube algorithm said was the fastest to solve. The three algorithms I chose are part of this algorithm family called CFOP, which means cross, F2O, or first two layers, orientation, and perpetuation. Cross will make a cross on a side. F2L, or first two layers, will solve the first two layers of the cube. Then orientation and perpetuation will solve the last layer. The three algorithms I chose were beginner CFOP, intermediate CFOP, and advanced CFOP. The hypothesis I made was that the intermediate CFOP algorithm set will be the quickest. My procedure was that I would mix up the Rubik's Cube, set up my timer, and solve the Rubik's Cube. I would record the time it took, and once I do all five trials for each algorithm, 
I would average them. And the type of data I collected was time. And the quicker the time, the better the data was. My results show that my hypothesis was actually wrong, and it showed that the beginner CFOP was the quickest. I s if I were to do this project again, I'd spend more time on this project to learn more algorithms, and so I have a larger assortment of data points. Rubik's cubes don't have to be difficult, they can just be fun, just like this project. So I'll leave you with this. Rubik's cubes are fun if you use them correctly. My name is Caitlin Hastings, and for my STEM fair project, I decided to see which part of Grantham is the most polluted. I hypothesized that the outside of the fire department would be the most polluted because cars and fire trucks go by it on a daily basis. I created a pollution collector by flattening a milk carton and applying petroleum jelly to it. Then I hole punched the carton, added string to it, and hung it up on a tree. The petroleum jelly makes the pollution particles stick to the milk, milk carton. My graph shows that the outside of the Grantham Fire Station is the most polluted of the areas that I tested and that the inside of the fire station is the least polluted. I thought that Johnny Fields would be the least polluted, but it turns out that the inside of the fire station was the least polluted. If I could conduct the experiment again, I would have more places to test than just three. I would like people to know that every place has pollution of some sort because wind, cause wind can carry it over thousands of miles. My name is Aiden and my project was about electromagnets. My question was, how strong is an electromagnet? My hypothesis was, I think that the more copper wire the iron core has, the stronger it will get. I wrapped a total of four iron cores and started at 50 and went up by increments of 50 with each core. I put out 100 standard paper clips and tested five times how many paper clips each one picked up. None of the electromagnets picked up 10. The only electromagnets that worked were the ones with 50 and the ones with 150. I, I would make the iron core solid, not hollow, and use a 9 volt battery instead of a 6 volt battery. I want to say that electromagnets can be strong, but this one wasn't. Hi, my name is Colby. My project was to see whether people prefer virtual reality over 2D pictures. My hypothesis was that people would prefer virtual reality over 2D pictures because VR is more realistic than 2D. First, I had to find 9 people who were willing to try out the project. Then I got my VR and the 2D pictures and asked them to observe them, both timing them on how long they looked at the pictures and the VR. Next, I had to fill out their time and what they preferred. Finally, I asked some questions. Are they familiar with virtual reality? Are they comfortable using the platform? And if they were dizzy or nauseous after using after the use of VR? My results came out as expected. Seven out of nine preferred virtual reality over 2D pictures. If I were to conduct this experiment again, I would definitely make my spreadsheet different because it was hard to put on my board. So then I had to do graphs instead, which took way longer. What I want people to learn from this is that VR can be a lot more realistic than 2D pictures many people are used to. Hello, my name is Gavin and the project I was building and testing is a Vibra Robot. A Vibra Robot is a small robot that has two batteries that make it move, a coin cell battery and a mini vibration motor. What I was wondering is what, what floor the Vibra Robot moves best on. My hypothesis was that the bumpier the floor was, the slower the Vibra robot would go. What I did first was to measure out five feet and how long it took to finish. Then I wrote that down. I collected the data on how long it took and a certain floor type. And I did four trials on each floor. My results were that polished wood was the best because how smooth it is. I would change some sort of floor types so I could collect more data. My name is Dylan Moore, and my topic was, what materials make the best conductors? My hypothesis was, if I change the conductor materials, then it will change if the light bulb is on or off. I s thought the most successful materials would be copper and metal. For my procedure, I hooked up the copper slab 
Then, if the light bulb turned on, the copper would be a conductor. If the light bulb did not turn on, it would be an insulator. I used the alligator clip to connect the batteries to the materials, and I used an alligator clip to connect the materials to the light bulb. In my experiment, I used copper, steel, plastic, and rubber as trial conductors. My data was that the steel and copper can conduct electricity, and the rubber and plastic cannot. If I would to do this experiment again, I would add more materials on so the experiment would be more interesting. What I want you to learn in this project is that not all materials can conduct electricity because not all materials let electricity flow through them. Thank you. My name is Kaylin Rappaport and for my STEM project I studied the science of serification. Spherification is where you take different liquids and use chemical reactions to make soft, squishy spheres. Juice balls are also known as boba, which is put in bubble tea. I wanted to know how much calcium citrate it would take to make the perfect juice ball and what type of liquid would be the best to use. My hypothesis was that some liquids would work while others would fall apart when the juice ball was attempted. My data shows that I was correct. When I used Coca-Cola and tomato juice, the balls formed. But when I tried the grape juice, no matter how much calcium citrate I used, the juice balls would not form. In the end, Coca-Cola and one gram of calcium citrate made the best juice ball. If I were to do this experiment again, I would change out the grape juice for orange juice, which is a little more acidic. My name is Trevor. For my project, I chose to try and see how a basketball would bounce and fly through the air if it were not full of air. My hypothesis was that it would not be able to bounce until it was around three-fourths full of air. My question was, would the basketball even be able to bounce? My plan was to get a basketball and fill it up one-fourth full of air. Dribble it and shoot it. The core how it went and keep trying this with two-fourths air and three-fourths air. All the data was recorded and was hard work. And it took time, but in the end it was all taken. If I were to do this again, I would definitely have somebody dribble and cheat besides me so I could have more data. This project showed me how a round ball reacts with different amounts of air. After careful research and lots of thought and consideration, I determined that my interests lay in the subject of aerodynamics. My question was, does the angle of attack affect how high the airfoil goes? Before we start, let's learn some vocabulary. The AOA stands for the angle of attack. It is the angle between the cord line and the wind direction. The cord line goes from one side of the wing to the other side. The sides are called the leading and the trailing edge. So I would adjust the AOA by making the airfoil more tilted and then letting out air using a vacuum to make it go up. The vacuum will represent the wind direction. There are two different airfoils. They are the asymmetric and the symmetric airfoil. The asymmetric is the GAW1. That is the name of the airfoil, and it is also known as the LS10417. It is called the NASA Langley Whitcomb, and the symmetric is the NACA0012. That is the name of the airfoil, and it stands for National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. I thought that the GAW1 would fly for 5, 9, and 0 degrees. I also thought that the NACA0012 would fly for five and nine degrees. The steps I took to make it was to build the hot wire cutter, cut out the styrofoam airfoils using the hot wire cutter, and to make a base that the airfoil would rest on. To conduct the experiment, blow each airfoil and change the degree to zero, five, nine, and 13 degrees. The results were that the GAW1 and the NACA0012 both flew for five, nine, and 13 degrees. Next time, if I were to conduct it again, I would have used a square fan because the wind is evenly distributed. The big idea is that the results showed that the higher the angle of attack, the higher the airfoil goes. Thank you for your attention.